Welcome back, crew. While June may be winding down, it's still Lancer RPG month for our channel. Uh, we've already taken a look at our first impressions of the system. We've went over how to build a PC using the mech guidelines from the Lancer system. And today we're going to be taking a deep dive into the Lancer RPG mechanics, showing you how to handle combat, narrative play, and some of the checks in between with this system. But before we dive into that, a few shout outs we want to do. Uh, the first, if you enjoy seeing some of these mechanics and want to see how it's played live, join us next week, Wednesday, at 7 p.m. Eastern Time on my channel, Tegan J Gaming at Twitch. And you'll get to see me and my crew play the system out and get to experience all the Lancer mechiness and goodness live uh, with us as we all go through with our first times in the Lancer system and experiment with some of the different combinations and how the mechanics work and how everything flows with this amazing system. So come hang out with us and see it played live. And if that's not enough to get you in the seat or tuned in to us, we're also going to be giving away a copy of the PDF of the Lancer RPG system. One of my big goals with creating this channel was to get more people into out of the 5e sphere and into different RPGs. So that's why every time we have a game of the month during that actual play, we'll be giving away a copy just so you can see a new system and bring it back to your crew and have some fun with uh, the amazing Lancer system. So join us and maybe you'll be one of the lucky ones. Also, I just want to give a shout out to the Lancer community as a whole. You guys have been super welcoming, uh, super active and engaged. I truly appreciate all the likes and views. And I uh, just really wanted to say thank you from the bottom of my heart on that side. So appreciate you guys. But let's dive into it. So today we're going to take a look into the core mechanics uh, of the Lancer system. Going over what they mean, how they've come up in uh, gameplay, and just kind of some tips and tricks for uh, either running them with your crew or playing them, with your play or playing them as a player. Uh, so before we dive into the core mechanics, I do want to get one of the, the, the biggest or one of the things I think come up so often in the book and it's something you really want to keep an eye out for as you're playing. Uh, so with this system, if you're used to 5e, there's a different way to kind of modify your roles with this system. For 5e, it's advantage and disadvantage. For this system, it's accuracy and difficulty. So similar in theory, but very different in practice. So these are going to be different things you can either have as pluses or minuses to your roles, uh, depending on the situation you put yourself in. Accuracy is so if you put yourself in a better position, like maybe you're hidden from your opponent and you got to line up a good shot, you can get a certain amount of points of accuracy for that role. And basically what these both do uh, is for if you have a point of them, whether it be plus or minus for accuracy or difficulty, you roll 1d6. Uh, and for accuracy, you roll 1d6 and add it to your d20 roll. One, for uh, the difficulty, you roll 1d6 and minus it from your d20 roll. Cool thing with this system is you can have multiple points of accuracy or difficulty. Uh, so if you put yourself in a very advantageous spot, you could have up to, or you could have as many as 3d6 uh, advantage points that you can add to your roll. But they do, and I know a lot of people are like worried, oh, that's just going to get like DC creep, it's going to be such a high number, uh, they can't possibly fail. They did a cool way to do this. So rather than have all of those added to, you've got 3D6, and let's say you get a 2, a 4, and a 5. With that 3D6, you're going to take that highest dice roll, so with that, that'd be a 5, and add it to your D20 roll. So let's say you rolled a D10 on your D20, uh, you'd add that 10 plus your 5 from the D6, it'd be a 15, just completely ignoring the 2 and the 4. So it's a good way to kind of recognize putting yourself in a strategic position, get a little bit more certainty on your roll, but not kind of bloat the numbers so it involves a lot of math or just makes it impossible to fail. So I really like that. I think it's kind of a good system. It's easy, simplistic, but effective. And the same thing applies for disadvantage versus instead of picking the highest, you pick the lowest. Also with this, or I should say disadvantage, difficulty. So with this system though, you can have multiple points, but you can also have situations where you may have a difficulty and an uh, accuracy point. With those, they minus out. But if you ever have like four points of difficulty, two points of accuracy, they'd minus out and you've got those still two points of difficulty uh, that you'd have to resolve with a 2d6. So kind of a cool way. I think it's a very, as an elegantly simplistic uh, way to uh, encourage players to think out of the box and put themselves in good positions while still having uh, It'd be grounded within the numbers. So now that we've got that out of the way, since it's mentioned so often, I wanted to just hit that right at the top before we dived in. So 
Nice to see the PDF of the system. Shout out to the team again. The bookmarks are insanely helpful. Uh, so lucky winner for this system. Check out those bookmarks. The team did a great job with those. So we're going to hit three big pieces with how we're kind of your core checks with the Lancer system. So we got skill checks, attack rolls, and saving throws. Skill checks, we're going to hit those first. So skill checks with the system are pretty easy. Uh, you're going to roll uh, kind of what the skill is, whether it be uh, kind of from the core mech skills or maybe something that's triggered from your pilot. And we're going to go over those as we go. Uh, but the easiest thing with this, DC is almost always going to be 10. So with this system, uh, it's not where the it's a little bit different than 5e where the, the DM or the GM sets the difficulty. With this, unless it's modified, 10 is going to be the core difficulty for any check that the uh, players are going to go through. So keeps it simplistic, keeps it uh, kind of easy for kind of players to know what to expect. But the nice thing though is they do give you some tools as a GM to tweak that difficulty if you need be. So you'll see at the bottom of the page there's three kind of core ways to tweak it. Uh, the difficult, risky, and heroic. And now note difficult is different than difficulty that's tied to accuracy. Difficult is just going to be a way to add plus one to the check. And you can add multiple levels of difficult. Uh, to the check uh, and kind of bump up that DC if need be. Uh, now this one is the most standard check should be at a 10. Only use those difficult if it doesn't fit into the risky or heroic uh, kind of ones, which we'll go into later, and you really need to reflect that risk for the player. So now we've touched on the heroic or difficult. Let's touch on risky. Risky is a cool one. I like this one. I'll probably be using it quite a bit during our actual play. Uh, risky is one where you can secede, but still have some... Uh, consequence or some kind of unpending doom that may be coming towards you so for instance let's say you are trying to hide uh, your mech uh, within uh, kind of uh, the battleground from approaching a uh, patrol of uh, enemy mechs let's, you hit there you beat the dc 10 because risky still has that dc 10 but even though you succeeded that patrol is still coming towards you, you hear the clank of the mechs marching at you and you've got to do something before that consequence comes at you uh, and there's different ways you can apply, but the basic of it is if you beat the DC 10 but don't go above 20, you're going to face some consequence for the roll. Uh, and with that, so it's a kind of a risky roll. Nice thing, though, is if you do beat a DC 20, you, you get away scot-free. You did whatever you needed to do so well uh, that you didn't even have to worry about it. So on the other side, though, so with risky, where you can still secede partially at your goal, uh, but with some consequences... Heroic roles are ones that you have to beat a DC 20 to get to, to get what you're looking for. So just something to kind of keep an eye out for. Those are going to be big ones where it's kind of like the action star movie moment where your players have done something kind of larger than life. Uh, they need the skill and the gumption to come through with it. Uh, so they've got to beat that DC 20 and hopefully they prepared and got some ways to stack the deck for it. Uh, but those are just going to be kind of those big roles uh, where there's just kind of a, a real, real standout moment in the gameplay. So with these though, so you've got these three different ways to modify the roles. One of the big things with this system though is you'll want to give your players a heads up of what they're going up against. Uh, typically with 5e, a lot of times uh, keeping the DC hidden is kind of the, the prerogative of the DM. But with this one, you want to tell them, hey, this is going to be a risky role. This is going to be a heroic role. Uh, this might just be a little bit more of a difficult role. That way they know what's coming up and they can choose how they want to go about it. Maybe they don't want to pursue that action uh, because their pilot should have a decent idea of how this is going to go across and how much effort it would take to accomplish. So let them let them be in on that. Give make sure they know what's going on so they can kind of accurately uh, go through it themselves. So we've touched a little bit on the skill check rules. But let's move on to skill checks to attack rolls. Attack rolls are simple, uh, and we're going to do a combat section a little bit later on in the video. But for attack rolls, you roll your d20, you add grit to it. So d20 plus grit and it goes against the person's evasion. So rather than going up against a DC-10, you're going to go up against one of that mech, one of that pilot's evasion is, and if you hit it or beat it, you get to hit the, the target. Uh, so now, what they mentioned with this is that your rolls are going to be a little bit lower, or a little more wild, I'll say, because uh, grit's usually going to be a lower number. For the first few levels, it's, level, it's either a plus one to two, or you don't even have grit. Uh, so something to keep in mind, you may miss a little bit more, uh, but just so they keep, uh, you gotta, that's how it will flow with this system. So that's how to make an attack roll. Saving throws are very, if you've played 5e, you're very used to how saving throws in this system will work. 
how the target sets a DC based off of their proficiency or kind of what they've got enabled with their skill or equipment that they're utilizing. Uh, and then you roll based on the save that it procs. Uh, so if it chooses from the four core skills, so it may be a hull check, an agility check, a systems check, uh, whatever it may be, you'll roll that and add your modifier and see if you're able to beat their check. Cool. So that's attack rolls, saving throws, and checks. Those are kind of the skill checks, the biggest things. Uh, they're going to come up with the system. Just a quick little look at those. But now that we've gone through that, there are a couple other things I want to hit. Before we dive into combat, the other big thing to keep an eye out for is with your pilot, you get to pick your own background. And with that background, you can choose triggers that go along with your pilot skills and just personality traits and allows your background and your pilot just kind of inner personality to shine through during both narrative during narrative play i should say uh so these are only available during the narrative play but they give you a plus two bonus to something that you can do like one of them is blow it up or one of them is take control uh these are situations where your background comes into play and either the gm says hey add this to it or you say advocate for yourself and say hey i think gm i think this may apply what do you think uh and then you get to add that bonus to your d20 roll Typically, there's going to be used for skill checks, so if plus two can be pretty crucial when you're just trying to beat a DC 10, but the nice thing is as you level, you can increase your skills within there, uh, get it up to a plus four or plus six, uh, and just really put yourself in a great position to be able to roll through and hopefully accomplish whatever your PC is good at. So those are triggers. Just another quick note, I've said it before, but they're just for narrative play. They don't apply to combat, but make sure you're getting a good use of them in the narrative play, especially blow something up. Go crazy, blow up some mechs. So, we've touched all the triggers, we've touched all the skill checks. Let's dive into the meat of it. Uh, this is going to be a big combat system, so let's take a look at what combat means with the uh, Lancer RPG. Now, with this system, I want to give another shout out to the reference materials they put. Uh, this is all the PDF, it's a little bookmark, but if you have like the regular book, page 76, Take a look at this, see if you can find a way to copy and print it if you don't have the PDF, uh, and bring this to your table because it's going to be invaluable. Uh, this basically gives you a run through of how your combat, what you can do and how combat will function with this. So, biggest thing here, before we get into what you could do on your turn, I want to go over initiative. Initiative is a little bit different in the system, but I think I may like it. Uh, so versus rolling initiative and kind of going through and seeing who does what, it's a little bit more collaborative and strategic. Uh, so, first thing is the player group always goes, or a member of the players will always go first. But what they do is at the start of combat, your players will discuss amongst themselves, and they'll choose one of the the players to go first. Uh, and that'll be your first player to go. And the, the GM was going to go through and pick one of their, their NPCs, and that NPC is going to be the first one to go. Uh, so the, the player will always go first, then that first NPC, second player, second NPC, and so on and so on and so on and so on uh, until you've completed the, uh, the first round and you guys start from the top. I like this. I think it'll be fun because it allows some more strategy and collaboration in the combat side versus just leaving it to chance. It allows your players to, to pick the big guns out first or the, the person that has the ability they think will be most game-changing in this situation. Uh, but it also allows your bad guys to do the same. You can strategize just as much as them and uh, kind of make sure that you put yourself in a pretty advantageous position too. So I think it's cool. I'm looking forward to see how it plays out in person. So now that we've done that, let's go over what you can do on your turn. Uh, so on your turn, you've got a couple big things you can do. So each turn, no matter what, uh, as long as you can move, you can take the move option, uh, which is going to allow you to move up to your speed on the map. Uh, you could use your, they recommend using a hex map or you could use a grid map. Uh, you can kind of move those numbers of hexes or squares based off of whatever your max speed is. Pretty easy on that side. Uh, the cool thing with this one is you've got two options you can choose from on your for your actions. So you can either take a full action or two quick actions. Nice thing with this though is quick actions, you're allowed to uh, do some pretty cool stuff. Like, uh, literally when I was looking at it, I didn't think you'd be able to fire a weapon on a quick action. But with Skirmish, you could fire one of your weapons using a quick action. And the even nicer thing with this, too, is like, let's say you've got, uh, on one of your mounts, two auxiliary weapons. Let's say you've got a missile launcher and a pistol. Uh, with that, using a quick action, you could fire both of them. Because think if you're from 5e, think of them like light weapons. Uh, with the auxiliary ones, uh, if they're on the same mount and you fire one, you could fire the other. They do less damage, but... 
pretty cool to be able to fire both of them. And if you had two different uh, auxiliary mounts with those, you could blast away. Uh, just make sure that your mount is able to handle two auxiliary weapons. Uh, some of them are. I think Flex is a good one that can. There are others that can too. Uh, but a good way to get some great damage out. Uh, so also with quick actions, you can hide, you can ram, you can grapple, you can dash, boost. Uh, it's a lot of cool things you could do with those. Full actions, though, you get to do the barrage, uh, which allows you to fire two weapons on your turn. Uh, now with this, though, it's two. Uh, that can be even two different emplacements with uh, with uh, the, the, the auxiliary weapons. We can fire your two main cannons, or if you get a heavy cannon, you can fire that. Uh, Walked. Uh, so just some really cool things you could do there. Uh, you could also disengage, do some tech actions or improvised attacks, and uh, just a lot you can do here. And I'm not going to go through and name them all or go over what all of them does, uh, but check out page 76 with the correct references or go into the combat section. Uh, it gives you some more detail on what each of these does and how they can come into play. Uh, but the nice thing with this too is outside of just getting to pick your fool or your quick action, you also get to pick a risky gambit too. Uh, let's say you're in a situation where you need to get another quick action in, but you've already used your action. You could exchange some heat and overcharge your system. So we're going to get into overcharges a little bit later, which is a cool way to take some ownership, but add some risk in and get a little extra enhancement with your, uh, your mech during the combat. So that's just kind of a quick look at the combat actions. There's a lot more depth in there with the system. I just didn't want to bore you guys going through each piece, so check into it and throw in the comments, too, if you think there's something that you'd like me to cover a little bit more in depth. Uh, I'd be more than happy to go into that uh, just a little bit more and kind of highlight it as well. So drop a comment if you see something cool. But now that we've touched on that, we're going to move into the heat section for the mechs. So heat is a cool system that this, uh, this uh, the Lancer RPG system brings to bear. Uh, and what it does is allows you to, for certain abilities or certain options like overcharging, you gain heat. Uh, and heat kind of builds up throughout the battle if you don't have ways to mitigate it. Uh, and it potentially can come back and cause some harm to your mech. Uh, so with a mech, you usually have a heat cap for your, kind of depending on what type of mech and what uh, equipment you have on there. Like for the Everest, I'm not looking at it in front of me, but I believe it has a heat cap of six. So you can burn up heat until you get to that six and you're fine then. Uh, but once you get above that six, uh, you have to start doing some stuff. Uh, so with that, uh, if you exceed your heat cap, you take one point of stress. Uh, and then you also need to roll 1d6 for each point of stress you have on the heat table. Uh, and that includes the one you just gained. So if you just have one, you just roll 1d6. If you got three on there, you roll 3d6. And for this one, you take the lowest. And if you look at that heat table, the lower you get, the worse it gets. Uh, so meltdown at number one. So if you get that, or if you get multiple ones, it can be pretty brutal. You go into a uh, irreversible meltdown. So stay ahead of that. Keep a watch on that uh, as you're going through. So yeah, you've got that. Uh, but also we mentioned you can overcharge during a turn, which is a cool mechanic I like. And it has you uh, more dangerous the more you do it. Uh, so if you overcharge one turn during a combat, you just get plus one heat. That's not too bad. Overcharge twice during a combat, you get one plus one D3 heat. You do it again, one D6. If you go again, you get one D6 plus four, which is probably going to put you into a pretty bad situation, getting closer to a reactor meltdown as you're making those overheating checks, because uh, most likely you've exceeded your heat cap by then. So just something to keep a cool lookout for. Uh, but... That's just a look at there. The other big thing I'll mention there is uh, they've got a mechanic called Danger Zone. If you're an Archer fan, sorry, I had to do it. Uh, but Danger Zone is when you get to ha at least half or above of your heat cap. It allows you to use certain abilities or certain functions or equipments that your mech may have. Now, these would be things you have to choose or certain mechs do come with that ability built in. Uh, but this gives you some things to work with, especially if you're going to be using a heat mech that you know you're going to be building some heat. It may be good to have some danger zone abilities because they're usually pretty pretty strong just due to the risk that comes along with them. So keep it out for those. But now that we've talked about heat, uh, let's talk about the structure. So with uh, heat, if you overcharge, uh, with you beat your heat cap, you can gain a structure point. Uh, and let's go into what structure points mean and kind of how structural damage is handled. Uh, so with Lancer, similar to a lot of RPG systems, you have HP. Uh, so let's say for our guy, for this example, he's got 10 HP. With a mech, 
you typically start with four structure points. Sometimes NPCs usually have one, uh, but for PC players, they're gonna have four structure points. Uh, so let's say that mech that has 10 HP, somebody comes up, blast them with a, a missile launcher and they lose 10 HP in that attack. With this, since so you're going to 10 HP, you're gonna take a structure point. So whatever you reduce to zero HP, you take one structure damage and then you make a structure damage check. And that structure damage check is very similar to the heat check. You roll 1d6 for each structure damage point you have, taking the lowest and you go on that structure damage table to see what the result will be. Fairly simple so far. But for let's say that same guy, so you took that 10 HP damage, you're at zero HP, you've taken your structure point and rolled on the table. What happens is you go back up to 10 HP again. So each time you go down to zero with your structure points, if you have structure points left, it brings you right up to your full HP again. Kind of cool. Now, let's take that same example. Let's say somebody started doing 10 HP to your mech, they did 15 HP. That's going to move you down, so let's say it puts you at negative five. So you get a refresh, you go up to your 10 HP again, but you minus out any over damage from that new HP. So versus starting at 10 HP, after that 15 damage, you would start at 5 HP. So with this, it's possible if you get hit with a nasty attack to lose multiple points of structure damage. Uh, and you, you, roll, you just roll that one check, but if you lost two points, you've got to roll 2d6 even if you were at four before. So kind of cool on that side. Nice thing too uh, with this. So you're kind of wondering like, oh, that's probably a lot of HP blow. You just kind of keep going back and back. But if you hit zero structure damage, your mech is done. Uh, it is destroyed. Uh, just something, something to keep in mind on that side. I thought it was kind of a cool way to do the system. I like how it goes back up, and I like how they keep the overage damage. So let's see how that plays in person. Uh, let's see how it kind of works for me and my crew. But that's a look at all, most of the core mechanics for the, the Lancer system. And, and I should say, it's a look at the biggest things you're going to come across in the combat or a narrative play section. We went over the triggers, skill checks, and how they work on the narrative side. Uh, we also went over the combat, how you get initiative, what the different actions are, uh, as well as how to handle heat and structural damage. But this system's dense. There's a lot more in there that we didn't cover. Uh, so if you in the comments see something that we didn't touch on, shout it out, throw it in there. I'd love to do more of the Lancer videos, uh, even after uh, we kind of finish it as a game of the month. Uh, I've been really enjoying it. So if there's something you think we didn't cover, then we should throw it in. I'd be happy to make another video to cover it. Uh, but overall, that was a deep dive into the Lancer system. Uh, our next video before Wednesday, uh, we're going to be diving into how to build a hostile NPC to free your party. So we're going to be building our uh, big bad mech uh, that our party is going to go up against this Wednesday. So join us Sunday for that. I'm looking forward to it. I love building monsters. So uh, this is going to be cool to see how it works with this system, how we can flex it and give our players a challenge. So check us out there. Uh, but also... Make sure you come through this Wednesday, the 29th at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, the party and I are going to have a blast rolling in with the Lancer RPG system. I want you guys to see the shenanigans they get up to uh, as they go against their dire mission and bring out their uh, insane looking mechs. So come through, hang out with us, check out this amazing system. And maybe you'll be one of the lucky ones and get your chance to win the Lancer RPG in our raffle uh, and bring it home to your crew. So enjoyed and maybe uh, the dice will be in your favor but also thank you guys again for your support truly appreciate how the Lancer community has come out and uh, liked and watched the videos like it's just uh, it's kind of blowing my mind and I just want to say thank you uh, and if you're new to the channel drop a like drop a subscribe follow us on Twitch uh, Twitch we're all there every week uh, playing some type of game so follow hang out with the crew and see the shenanigans see the jokes the fun uh and just get to hang out once we uh we, we play some real actual plays but overall thank you guys and until next time